Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, Part 1, Chapter 13. Go, di, di, go, go, di, go, di, go, go, di, go. It was the Equator talking to the clan. One of the things every man learned was the language of the hollowed out wooden instrument. Dim, 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 boomed the cannon at intervals. The first cock had not crowed, and no morphia was still swallowed in sleep and silence when the equa began to talk, and the cannon shattered the silence. Men stared on their bamboo beds and listened anxiously. Somebody was dead. The cannon seemed to rend the sky. The go go, the go di, di go go, floated in the message laden night air. The faint and distant wailing of women settled like a sediment of sorrow on the earth. Now and again, a full-chested lamentation rose above the wailing whenever a man came into the place of death. He raised his voice once or twice in manly sorrow and then sat down with the other men listening to the endless wailing of the women and the exoteric language of the air where now and again the cannon boomed. The wailing of the women would not be heard beyond the village, but the airquake carried the news to all the nine villages and even beyond. It began by naming the clan, Omofia Obododike, the land of the brave. Omofia Obododike, Omofia Obododike. It said this over and over again. And as it dwelt on it, anxiety mounted in every heart that heaved on a bamboo bed that night. Then it went nearer and named the village Iguedo of the Yellow Grinding Stone. It was a conqueror's village. Again and again, Iguedo was called, and men waited breathlessly in all the nine villages. At last, the man was named, and people sighed. Oh, Ezudu is dead. A cold shiver ran down Okonkwo's back as he remembered the last time the old man had visited him. That boy calls you father, he had said, bear no hand in his death. Ezudu was a great man and so all the clan was at his funeral. The ancient drums of death beat, guns and cannon were fired and men dashed about in frenzy, cutting down every tree or animal they saw, jumping over walls and dancing on the roof. It was a warrior's funeral, and from morning till night warriors came and went in their age groups. The all war smoked raffia skirts, and their bodies were painted with chalk and charcoal. Now and again an ancestral spirit, or a gugu, appeared from the underworld, speaking in a tremulous, unearthly voice and completely covered in raffia. Some of them were very violent and there had been a mad rush for shelter earlier in the day when one appeared with a sharp machete and was only prevented from doing serious harm by two men who restrained him with the help of a strong rope tied round his waist. Sometimes he turned round and chased those men and they ran for their lives. But they always returned to the long rope he trolled behind. He sang in a terrifying voice that a quinsu or evil spirit had entered his eye. But the most dreaded of all was yet to come. He was always alone and was shaped like a coffin. A sickly odor hung in the air wherever he went, and flies went with him. Even the greatest medicine men took shelter when he was near. Many years ago, another Egugu had dared to stand his ground before him and had been transfixed to the spot for two days. This one had only one hand and it carried a basket full of water. But some of the Egugu were quite harmless. One of them was so old and infirm that he leaned heavily on a stick. He walked unsteadily to the place where the corpse was laid, gazed at it a while, and went away again to the underworld. 
The land of the living was not far removed from the domain of the ancestors. There was coming and going between them, especially at festivals and also when an old man died, because an old man was very close to the ancestors. A man's life from birth to death was a series of transition rites which brought him nearer and nearer to his ancestors. Azudu had been the oldest man in his village, and at his death, there were only three men in the whole clan who were older, and four or five others in his own age group. Whenever one of these ancient men appeared in the crowd to dance unsteadily the funeral steps of the tribe, younger men gave way and the tumult subsided. It was a great funeral such as befitted a noble warrior. As the evening drew near, the shouting and the firing of guns, the beating of drums and the brandishing and clanging of matches increased. Ezudu had taken three titles in his life. It was a rare achievement. There were only four titles in the clan and only one or two men in any generation ever achieved the fourth and highest. When they did, they became the lords of the land. Because he had taken titles, Ezudu was to be buried after dark with only a glowing brand to light the sacred ceremony. But before this quiet and final rite, the tumult increased tenfold. Drums beat violently and men leaped up and down in frenzy. Guns were fired on all sides, and sparks flew out as matches clanked together in warrior salutes. The air was full of dust and the smell of gunpowder. It was then that a one-handed spirit came, carrying a basket full of water. People made way for him on all sides, and the noise subsided. Even the smell of gunpowder was swallowed in the sickly smell that now filled the air. He danced a few steps to the funeral drums and then went to see the cops. Hezudu, he called in his guttural voice. If you had been poor in your last life, I would have asked you to be rich when you come again. But you were rich. If you had been a coward, I would have asked you to bring courage. But you were a fearless warrior. If you had died young, I would have asked you to get life, but you lived long. So I shall ask you to come again the way you came before. If your death was the death of nature, go in peace. But if a man cost it, do not allow him a moment's rest. He danced a few more steps and went away. The drums and the dancing began again and reached fever heat. Darkness was around the corner and the burial was near. Guns fired the last salute, and the cannon rent the sky. And then from the center of the delirious fury came a cry of agony and shouts of horror. It was as if a spell had been cast. All was silent. In the center of the crowd, the boy lay in a pool of blood. It was the dead man's 16-year-old son, who with his brothers and half-brothers had been dancing the traditional farewell to their father. Okonkwo's gun had exploded and a piece of iron had pierced the boy's heart. The confusion that followed was without parallel in the tradition of Omorphia. Violent deaths were frequent, but nothing like this had ever happened. The only course open to Okonkwo was to flee from the clan. It was a crime against the earth goddess to kill a clansman, and a man who committed it must flee from the land. The crime was of two kinds, male and female. Okonkwo had committed the female because it had been inadvertent. He could return to the clan after seven years. That night, he collected his most valuable belongings into head loads. His wives wept bitterly and their children wept with them without knowing why. Obierika and half a dozen other friends came to help and to console him. They each made nine or ten trips carrying Okonkwo's yam to store in Obierika's barn. And before the cock crowed, Okonkwo and his family were fleeing to his motherland. It was a little village called Mbanta, just beyond the borders of Mbaino. 
As soon as the day broke, a large crowd of men from Ezudu's quarter stormed Okonkwo's compound, dressed in garbs of war. They set fire to his house, demolished his red walls, killed his animals and destroyed his barn. It was the justice of the earth goddess and they were merely her messengers. They had no hatred in their heart against the Konkwo. His greatest friend Obiereka was among them. They were merely cleansing the land which Okonkwo had polluted with the blood of a clansman. Obiereka was a man who thought about things. When the will of the goddess had been done, he sat down in his obi and mourned his friend's calamity. Why should a man suffer so grievously for an offense he had committed inadvertently? But although he thought for a long time, he found no answer. He was merely led into greater complexities. He remembered his wife's twin children, whom he had thrown away. What crime had they committed? The earth had decreed that they were an offense on the land and must be destroyed. And if the clan did not exact punishment for an offense against the great goddess, her wrath was loosed on all the land and not just on the offender. As the elders said, if one finger brought oil, it soiled the others.